Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar on intellectual property. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Law and Technology Center, I want to extend a very warm welcome. My name is Hao Chen Sun. I teach intellectual property and technology law at University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law. I'm thrilled that my colleague Norman Hoy is giving a public lecture on IP enforcement issues arising from the internet. So let me uh, introduce Norman to the audience first. Uh, Norman is a principal lecturer at our Faculty of Law, and uh, uh, he has been teaching a wide range of PCLL courses. Um, Norman was called to the bar in Hong Kong in 1997, uh, sorry, 1996, and uh, has maintained a practice at the bar. His practice is focused on intellectual property disputes, as well as general civil, commercial, and personal injury cases. He has appeared as a counsel in substantive intellectual property re related cases, inclusive of appearances in high court, copyright tribunal, and trademarks registry. Um, so now let me ask Norman to start his lecture. Thank you very much, Hao Chen. Um, this lecture is uh, designed, in fact, for two kinds of persons, obviously litigators. Uh, it's designed so that it'll give litigators an idea. If you don't have a background in IP, uh, in IP practice, then it hopefully we'll bring you up to speed on that. And for those of you who are IP practitioners, then we have a bit more of a detailed discussion on matters in relation to the internet. I will now switch over to a document which I prepared. I understand that it's been sent to all the registered attendees and I'll be referring to that now. Now, as you can see, um, the abstract for today's discussion was really is really about how we are getting to grips with living life in the digital uh, realm. So as mentioned in the abstract, we see that corporate competitors and disgruntled individuals are now increasingly using the internet as a platform to make attacks on the owners of IP and the related look rights. Of course, these disputes will be generally grounded in IP based law, but also some associated uh, causes of action in relation to IP generally. But also it has the unique dif uh, difficulty and challenge that we have now is what are the challenges to enforcement when the internet is used as a platform? So I will discuss um, uh, what are the tra traditional forms of intellectual property. I also mentioned that there would be uh, related causes of action to IP. I'll also discuss what are the related forms of rights associated with intellectual property generally, and this will be uh, fairly universal across all the, the spectrum of IP related causes of action. Next, I'll talk about what is the internet being used, how the internet is being used as a platform to damage intellectual property and related rights. And then finally, how to enforce such intellectual property and related rights when the internet is involved, because we have slightly different considerations from your standard way of dealing with uh, IP cases. So before I get on to the um, elements in relation to the law, it is good to note that um, have some figures in mind in relation to how the internet is expanding and how that will eventually relate to matters of intellectual property law and enforcement. So do note that in 2011, uh, WIPO reported that from the years 1998 to 2006, estimates by Google was that the internet expanded by a factor of 1,000. Web pages grew from 29 million to some 25 billion pages. And that is only in the span of eight years, and that was quite some time ago. In 2021, there were nearly 2 billion websites with 56.5 billion indexed web pages on the internet, and that is obviously just an estimate, but also that there's some 4.6 billion people actively using the internet. So that gives you again, a scale of how things are moving. Certainly when it comes to numbers of people, 
it appears China has the largest number of people using the internet at nearly a billion, uh, billion people nearly. India is a uh, close second with nearly 700 million. And then America is at 250 million. But when we're talking about the actual domain names or do domains, I should say, America has some 130 odd million. China is quite a distant second at nearly 20 million, but still a substantial amount. And then Germany comes in at three at 12 plus million. It's no surprise that Google is going to be the most searched, but we also know that when it comes to um, more pertinent to this today's lecture is that uh, the EU IPO in 2016, they made a study. And it seems that when it comes to uh, business on the internet, whether it's B2B or B2C, we know that in 2014, nearly 14% of all business turnover is carried out by e-commerce. Now, how has that been, um, how, how do we see that in Hong Kong? Well, in 2019, the Legco Sec Secretariat then gave us a study which showed in 2009 to 2019 that mobile pen uh, subscription penetration rate went from 72% to 316. Obviously, people might have more than one uh, digital device. Household broadband penetration went from 80% to 94%. So household broadband penetration has always been pretty high. And in relation to proportion of businesses using the internet went from 61% to 90%. When it comes to e-commerce in Hong Kong, that is actually quite limited at the time in 2009 at 139 billion. But in 2018, that is nearly uh, or double or almost tripled in amount to 491 billion odd in 2018. So when it comes to um, usage of the internet, obviously, that's just going to be a growing trend. All of us under the um, uh, COVID restrictions have done work from home, and I'm sure that number has grown exponen exponentially because of the fact that we're all stuck at home and glued to our, our, our computers and phones, what have you. Obviously, when it comes to um, matters of the internet, um, there are going to be several aspects that we can discuss, uh, but in relation to the matters of IP, I will, as a result, not be lecturing on the questions of internet fraud, but you will see from the note which I've given you, I've given you a summary of some examples of how internet fraud cases are dealt with. In the court of first instance, you can see the lowandepot.com case, which was uh, delivered by the Honorable Mr. Justice uh, Louis Chan in September, 2018. And also uh, in the district court, in the case of Synaptic Technology, which was a case delivered uh, on the 9th of July, 2020 by his honor, Judge Andrew Lee. Just to let you know, of course, I think it's no surprise, the way in which these internet cases work in relation to a fraudster, basically they try to A, imitate an existing business, or they try to conduct what appears to be a legitimate business. Either way, what happens is the fraudster will then eventually contact the uh, target, as it were, and then after that, um, deal with that target through what would appear to be proper business transactions, and then, of course, defraud that amount from the target. Now, when it comes to this sort of situation, eventually, um, once the, the innocent party gets wind of this, then they start to take legal action. Once legal action has been uh, uh, initiated, Usually the fraudster at that stage will tend to disappear. Um, however, the, 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 obviously the, the defrauded party, the, um, the company or the, the, the business entity that was imitated would still play a part in those proceedings as with the bank because they still have a, a stake in the ongoing uh, litigation that has arisen because of this sort of internet fraud. I will also not cover matters in relation to the Copyright Amendment Ordinance and or the, uh, the, the forthcoming uh, changes to the Copyright Ordinance generally. You can see this in the notes at paragraph 16, but generally speaking, um, when it came to the uh, Copyright Amendment Ordinance, basically it's dealing with people with visual impairment and the newer parts of the um, amendment to the Copyright Ordinance, that will deal with a, a, a variety of things that are to be um, 
considered and then hopefully put into legislation because I think Hong Kong is really quite behind in this regard. And what it'll deal with is issues dealing with streaming. There'll also be new criminal offenses relating to distribution, caching data for day-to-day -day internet activities regarding current affairs that will be allowed, but uh, you will see that in due course. Um, there will be exemption for online service providers against uh, liability for corporate infringement by third-party infringers. And also the last one, which is quite interesting, is increasing potential awards for additional damages. As you know, under Section 108 of the corporate Copyright Ordinance, there is already a provision for additional damages. Um, I can, I'm sure those of you who practice IP law and are familiar with IP law will also know that there have not been many decisions in relation to Section 108 on additional damages, but that is about to become more significant with the new amendments that are coming. So if I may now go to some matters in relation to difficulties when we have uh, matters in relation to um, infringers who are using the internet and that sort of online platform. Obviously, one of the primary difficulties we have when it comes to dealing with um, online infringement is finding the so-called proper infringing parties. Um, of course, as you can imagine, whether it's a fraudster or a, a person who's just doing flat out illicit uh, activity on the internet and damaging uh, someone's IP rights, obviously they're going to use a pseudonym. Aside from a pseudonym, sometimes it'll just be through a website and you won't know who's going to be, who's operating it, or they might be using false names and or they might have cor corporate identities that are shielding from their, um, uh, their, their real uh, persons. Another difficulty that we have is of course, sometimes they'll be outside the jurisdiction. Um, that's the beauty and danger of the internet. It is global. So we have to deal with that uh, factor as well. Also, sometimes when we are talking about uh, cause of action, which require there to be uh, a mens rea knowledge, then it might be difficult to, to have established sufficient knowledge to have a cause of action active against that infringer. One example would be uh, in copyright law, if someone is a secondary infringer, of course, they must have knowledge before that cause of action is complete. Of course, you then have difficulty in these proceedings dealing with the internet because you have so much that's happening 24 seven that once you have knowledge of such um, infringing activity taking place, you are basically on a, on, a, on, a, on a timer. You don't have that much time to get your case going. Finding out who they are, finding out how to deal with this sort of infringing action uh, through the internet. We all know, especially those of you who practice uh, IP law, that delay is going to be fatal for any form of injunction that you'll be seeking. And we know that with IP law, the injunction is going to be the single most important and primary form of relief that you'll be seeking. So as we saw in cases such as Harborfit Seafood or Harborfit, Harborfit Industrial, the general rule of thumb is six weeks. Once you have knowledge of the infringing action, you've got to get your, your both the, the client uh, and all the um, associated um, persons needed to assist the client, your legal team ready to move within those six weeks if you're going to seek some form of interlocutory injunctive relief. Now, of course, if you're not successful at the application for uh, interlocutory injunction in relation to some IP rights that's being infringed, then even in, in Harbor Fit Industrial, what you can try to do as a somewhat of a halfway house is then seek speedy trial directions. Uh, that was done in that case. And if you wanna seek uh, more uh, ways in which the court will look at how to exercise its discretion, and whether granting to and whether granting a speedy trial order, please see this case of Chin Hai Xin Hua Kang Financial Holdings. It's a decision given by uh, uh, Deputy High Court Judge Ki Kyung SC, as he then was, of course, on the 14th of September 2018. It is now referenced at footnote 11 for your consideration. Another thing is obviously when you're dealing with um, online infringement matters, is 
The problem is once you have your, your case um, in hand, the question is how do you move ahead? And there are difficulties coming because if you are unable to achieve either an interim injunction, an interlocutory injunction, or summary judgment, and that's usually the pattern in which we do things with IP cases, which are pretty, pretty straightforward, then what happens is everything is going to be backlogged and you have to go to trial. Now, of course, we now have the benefit of PD 22.1. And we're very, um, Hong Kong's very lucky to have the Honorable Mr. Justice David Locke, who is the IP judge of Hong Kong. Um, but even then, I mean, there's a backlog of cases. So you want to stop the infringing activity as soon as possible. And if you're going all the way to trial, given the amount of work that would have to go into preparing an IP case for trial, let alone any civil case, but an IP case, you're looking from the point of initiation of the issue, issue of writ all the way until you are ready and have a hearing date for trial, it wouldn't be surprising to have at least one and a half to two years before you're ready for trial. And then you still have to fix that date for trial. Typically in an IP case, if it's going to be of anything of any substance, five days, a five day trial we all know is going to put you back at least another nine months to a year. And of course, if it's going to be heard by the IP judge, then you have to be sure that he has his diary clear for such um, case to be heard. And of course, juggling of diary dates is always going to be difficult. Now, another difficulty is in obtaining full relief, what I call full relief, because of the fact, as I mentioned earlier on uh, in this section, is that if you are unable to identify clearly all the, the potential de uh, defendants, then recovery of costs, of course, moving towards uh, uh, damages after uh, training type discovery is given, that's going to be a problem as well. So your client might think, well, is it really worth it? if I'm not able to achieve the kind of um, success that I want, which is the typical relief, which I'll discuss later on, plus costs. Cost is always something that's going to be very much in a commercial client's mind. So please bear those facts uh, in, 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 in mind. Now, as I mentioned earlier on at the beginning of this lecture, is that this um, lecture is designed not just for IP litigators, but people who are litigators but want to understand and perhaps eventually move into the practice of, of IP litigation. So what I've done is I've explained it as best I can, as there being different families within the IP umbrella. And the first, but not necessarily the most important, I just put them in this particular order as I'll explain later on. The first family is really the family of copyright and registered design. Now, I call them a family because they, are, they, they have similarities to each other. Of course, they're different causes of action, copyright being an unregistered, right? And of course, registered design, of course, is going to be registered by its name. So there is a uh, almost a twin-like effect between the two when it comes to this particular family. Now, I'm not going to go into detail of how to establish the cause of action in relation to each of these um, areas or, or these different families, in the IP umbrella of groups, but I've provided to you in writing here, but just overall, just to remind uh, persons who are attending this lecture, what would be the basic things that you would need to establish? And it's usually the big three, and that is originality, subsistence, and ownership. Now, the way in which uh, these are going to be proven, of course, you'll have to plead it properly in your statement of claim, parties, and then all those elements don't forget that when you are dealing with a copyright claim, not only are you going to show the basis for that copyright, it will be drawings, it might be written work, it might be sculpture, things of that nature, but then also to show that there's not just originality, you're going to have to put them in an annex so that the defendants can see what it is you're talking about. It is an unregistered right, so they must be able to see what's it going to be. In any IP statement of claim, the standard will always have some form of annex. Annex to it will be those corporate works, or when it comes to registered um, IP rights, whether the registered design, the trademark registration, the standard or short-term patent, so on and so forth. So after you're able to establish that you there's originality, subsistence, and ownership of the, of the copyright in question, 
then you move on to the question of infringement. You'll note that when it comes to um, copyright infringement, there's going to be two types. I didn't mention primary infringement because I think that's quite simple. And I think all, all the persons attending this lecture will understand. Basically, primary infringement is copying, all right? And if you were in any doubt about that, then all you would have to do is see the uh, Copyright Ordinance Section 23 in relation to that. There's going to be more section of that, but that's the primary one we talk about primary infringement. What I've included in these notes, more importantly, is the question of secondary infringement. Now, secondary infringement is basically when you import, usually import or export into or out of Hong Kong. That's typically another act will be the act of secondary infringement because you're not making the copy in Hong Kong, nor are you issuing copies to the public in Hong Kong. When it comes to secondary infringement, as I mentioned earlier on, you must be able to, the plaintiff, establish knowledge. And without knowledge, secondary infringement will not be a viable cause of action. You must establish knowledge. But do note that when it comes to knowledge, that when a defendant turns a blind eye to the obvious, there can be actual knowledge since the defendant averts his gaze from the obvious. Aside from that, as I mentioned again earlier on, when it comes to copyright, there will also be the right for the claim to additional damages. Now, the next thing in this family, of course, is registered design. And of course, as the name itself suggests, you must have a registration. The thing with the registration, of registration rights generally, is that once you have this right, is that it is an exclusive right typically, and what will happen is that you will have the right to prohibit others from infringement. This is, uh, uh, applies across for all IP and related causes of action. Remember, the primary um, relief that you're seeking to enforce is an injunction, the right to say no. So when it comes to registered design, usually your biggest hurdle will be that of prior publication um, which would obviously defeat the registered design, okay? So that is something you have to bear in mind. So having proper solicitors to assist you into doing the registration, that is going to make, make sure that your hard earned work is going to be properly protected. Now, when it comes to um, another family of core IP, I would call it, would be the standard patent. Now, of course, Again, there's going to be a twin in this family. There's a standard patent, and then there's the short-term patent. Do note that when it comes to a standard patent, previous to, to the amendments to the patent ordinance, you would have registration of patents from other jurisdictions. Once that registration is made, you then have that patent to apply in Hong Kong. And once that's the case, then of course, it will be enforceable. But do note that when it comes to uh, standard patents, what will happen is that there will be a need to have a detailed examination. Do note that when it comes to patents generally, the process, which is new to the man or the person skilled in the art, that's the general term which we use in relation to establishing whether a patent is going to be valid or not. Having said that, when you're talking about registration of, of patents, um, large uh, corporations uh, will have its own team of very skilled uh, patent attorneys. Uh, patent attorneys are very, very expensive, not just because of the fact of what they do in drafting the specification of the patent, a difficult task, but it is also usually because of the fact that they have a, a very significant scientific or engineering background in the patent uh, that is being sought for um, examination. So if you're talking about pharmaceuticals, then of course you're gonna have to have a very expert person in pharmaceuticals as a background. Then that person would have to have a legal qualification to be a patent attorney. So this combination is very um, typical for, for a patent attorney, but it's also a very expensive process to have and hire these persons. But that's fine because it's something worth protecting. As I mentioned, the um, Patents Amendment Ordinance since 2016 and the rules, we have the commencement date of this 
since the 19th of December 2019, we now in Hong Kong have the necessary legal and procedural framework to have home registration, what we call original grant. So that can now be done locally. Um, from the information that I've been able to uh, obtain online, since uh, as of May 31st in 2021, there have been a total of 426 original grant applications, of which 33% were submitted by Hong Kong residents or enterprises and 67% were from non-local applicants. I recall it was roughly uh, two years ago, if I remember right. Um, we were very fortunate uh, in the law lectures for practitioners of that year, uh, Ms. Elsie Tse of the IPD came and gave a talk, not just about recent developments in the IPD, but also a discussion about uh, the new patents amendment ordinance. And I think uh, if you're interested, then you can contact the um, Faculty of Law to see if you can see or obtain um, information in relation to that particular lecture. It's a very uh, well-discussed, well-researched, and well-presented um, lecture by Ms. Elsie Zhe. Now, in relation to short-term patents, the main difference is this. Firstly, when it comes to short-term patents, it is not something that is seen globally. It, it's only seen in select countries, Hong Kong and mainland China being two of a few of them. The main difference is that a short-term patent, of course, is going to be shorter than a standard patent. A standard patent is going to be for uh, 20 years, whereas with the short-term patent is only going to be eight. But the difference being that there is no substantive examination of a short-term patent. What's important is that there's compliance with the formalities and then that will allow the applicant to achieve or obtain their short-term patent. When it comes to short-term patents, I can uh, tell you quite, um, quite confidently, to my knowledge, there is only one substantive case on short-term patents, and that's the SNE engineering case. It was heard by the Honorable Mr. Justice uh, David Locke, of course, and then it went to the Court of Appeal. Uh, those decisions are really the benchmark for understanding how the short-term patent system works, how a short-term patent and its, um, and its application are considered by the court because there's no formal examination like a standard patent that takes place in the course of the litigation. That's the way it's done. And then of course, um, what are going to be necessary uh, uh, specifications because there might, the, the, the short-term patent might fail for what we call a lack of sufficiency. Then we come to the next family, and that is again, a core IP uh, family, and that is trademarks and passing off. Um, trademarks, um, again, the, the registry in, in Hong Kong has been around forever, as, as long as I can remember. And it's, uh, I believe, one of the oldest registries of any form in Hong Kong generally. If I could remember right, it might be the first one. In any event, when it comes to trademark um, law, again, if you own the trademark, then of course you can prohibit people from um, unauthorized use of that trademark. Long story short, as we all know, section 18.1 of the Trademarks Ordinance provides that when there is um, use of the exact same mark, when we talk about a mark, they usually fall into one of three categories. We're talking about a word mark, as in, let's say, Nike, N-I-K-E, or a logo mark, that might be the swoosh mark, or what we have, what we call a combination mark. You add both the word and the device mark together. In any event, once you have this registration, um, if someone uses the mark, and we'll get back to this term of use later on, and it is the exact same device in the exact same class because service marks, trademarks, they must go by classification. You're not just talking about um, one form of mark that is going to apply to all forms of business. That wouldn't make any sense. So when you're applying, it must be registered in relation to whichever class it is. After that's done, then of course, if there's exact same mark and exact same class, that's section 18.1, that's strict liability. There are very limited defenses in relation to that because you own the registration. Of course, you have a section 18.2 or 18.3 situation 
that's going to be more akin to passing off. Now, speaking of passing off, we all know that it is a tort. Um, so in this tort, there are going to be elements. And the Holy Trinity of, of passing off is always going to be when there's goodwill of the plaintiff, if there's been a misrepresentation, which then leads to, to damage to the plaintiff, then there's going to be the classic trinity of passing off established. Uh, the more modern iteration is five-step iteration, but I think people understand the basics for passing off and why it's going to be important to deal with all those three elements. As all of you know, when it comes to uh, passing off, those of you who are IP practitioners, the last element is going to be the easiest one to prove, the damage element. It is going to be building and establishing properly the foundation for arguing the goodwill. Then, of course, the misrepresentation will be something that is going to be uh, tricky to deal with. But if you don't get over the first limb of goodwill, then nothing else is going to matter. So that is always going to be something in the forefront of any IP practitioner's mind is building up the goodwill properly on the evidence, of course, pleaded properly. And then you deal with the misrepresentation afterwards. The misrepresentation, misrepresentation can sometimes be tricky um, in relation to matters of how they exactly are using the, the goodwill in question. Now, the goodwill in question could also be in the form of some kind of logo, because if it's not registered, then of course you don't have a trademark. Sometimes it's going to be in a name. These elements are not going to be registrable. Therefore, you move on the basis of passing off. Do note that passing off is a highly useful cause of action because of its flexibility. Uh, it's also something that you'll note that there will be innocent passing off as well. That can happen and not a problem to be proven. Now, when it comes to the associated forms of IP rights that are in question, I mentioned defamation and malicious falsehood. Um, I mentioned these two because when it comes to defamation, there is a growing trend, of course, um, that especially with the internet, people say some really terrible things about each other on the internet. Not only that, but people now have um, more exposure of themselves to the public, and they would have rights in relation to their personality and their, their person, and that's more of a passing off thing. But don't forget that, nonetheless, when it comes to defamation, you have the right to be associated with the good standing of your name. So it's sometimes associated with IP matters. And of course, um, I've provided here at section D at page 11, a, a brief description of the, the elements you need to establish uh, the cause of action for defamation. Now, having said that, um, malicious falsehood, somewhat its twin, is something that we see sometimes associated in an IP case. Do note that when we talk about IP cases, we're not talking about only sometimes just talking about singular causes of action. It could be, it could be copyright thrown in together with trademark and passing off, combination thereof. The one that will tend to associate from the outside in to an IP case would be malicious falsehood. And we saw this in cases uh, such as um, the Guangdong Foodstuffs Import and Export Group case against Tong Fuk Wine. That's, that's a typical situation where the malicious falsehood um, cause of action was then also um, advanced together with that of trademark infringement. Now, when it comes to another associated cause of action to IP cases, it would be the family of confidential information and breach of fiduciary duty. Now, why do I mention that? It's because when it comes to certain kinds of IP cases, if it's a kind of IP case whereby the employer is the one, the, there's an employee who then comes out of the company taking that confidential information, then they're obviously going to be using it and it'll be damaging the, uh, the, the value of the company. And that, of course, using that confidential confidential information will be prohibited. So that's going to happen. Usually what they do is they take the employees, will then take with them customer lists, uh, supplier lists, things of that nature. 
And therefore, that would typically associate with the general IP case that might be also on uh, copyright. It might also be in terms of things which they're developing in the background. So that will be something which will have an IP nature. Because this person is leaving the employment of the uh, plaintiff in such a way wrongfully, taking such things, they might also be in breach of fiduciary duty as well. And that's why both confidential information and breach of fiduciary duty, they usually do come together as a pair. Now, when it comes to your typical IP case, what are the rights and relief that you're going to be trying to enforce? As I said, the primary um, relief you're going to be seeking is of course the injunction. Whether it's interim, interlocutory, or permanent, of course, we're talking about different scenarios which require uh, different treatment of such an application. But do note that when it comes to IP cases, um, it is not um, unusual that any one of them, or in fact, usually, sometimes all three, forms of injunction will be sought, and of course, at different stages. When it comes to delivery up, it is an ancillary uh, relief that we typically seek in an IP case. Of course, you want to take that infringing item out of the hands of the infringer. The next matter, of course, will be that of disclosure. Not only do you want to stop them from uh, continuing to infringe your, uh, your IP rights, you also want the possession of it by way of delivery up. You also want to know where it came from and where it's heading. So as a result, what you'll be doing is tracing the infringing goods, as it were, both up and down the chain, up in terms of where has it been sold to, and also down in terms of where did it come from. And of course, with most late clients, what their ultimate goal is to do is to find the factory, as it were, because once you find that, then you will stop hopefully all infringement from the source. Now, once you have interlocutory judgment, only then would you be allowed to have damages or an account of profits. You cannot have both. You must elect after the disclosure has been given to you, which only comes typically after interlocutory judgment, although in certain situations, you may be able to achieve it prior to that. Having said that, you must choose between damages and account of profits. Do note that if your cause of action includes copyright infringement, then of course you have additional to just damages, you have additional damages under section 108 of the copyright ordinance. And of course, you'll be seeking costs at all stages. Now, do note that when it comes to the breach of an injunction, in particular in an IP case, I can refer you to this case of Cartier, which was not too long ago, um, whereby once there was found that there was a breach of an injunction, the contemnors were brought before court, the company was fined $250,000, but the persons operating company and thus on a personal basis as contemnors, they were sent to imprisonment for six weeks. Costs were granted on an indemnity basis. Now, when it comes to IP actions relating to the internet, more specifically, we have different kinds. And I refer to them more or less as being there's a classic version, there's a more evolved version, and then, of course, there's the modern version. When it comes to the classic version, we're talking about straight up infringement on the internet, just wholesale um, infringement of uh, IP rights. An example I've given you is this case of the digital radio station called D100. And what happened was they had a license with RTHK and they were paying this license to RTHK and then they at some stage after negotiations broke down for the um, license to be renewed, they just kept using it. So in that situation, it was not difficult to establish um, the act of copyright infringement. What was more challenging was speed because it was happening 24 seven. We had to move very quickly on that case. So in that case, we moved for both interim injunction, interlocutory injunction, and then ultimately summary judgment. That is a case where um, the difficulty um, being speed, and also again, to, to explain properly to the court, um, the foundation for the copyright itself. Another example 
would be the older cases of BitTorrent. And of course, we have this case of Chan Nai Ming that went all the way to the CFA. And this case of Chan Nai Ming um, is still one that I think practitioners should bear uh, attention to, not just because of the, the still persisting problem of digital piracy online, but also the way in which you would have to break down your case to show how and where the IP was being infringed. Basically, I've highlighted the parts of, of Chan Nai Ming for you so you read that at your leisure. But basically, it is a step-by-step -step approach in showing how the IP, the internet protocol address is used to locate the seeding original infringer. Then after that, how the authorities would then go through um, forensically to trace through how the um, copyright, the infringing copyright came from this source. So it's a, a case I think that is still relevant to practitioners to be aware of uh, even to this day. Now do note that when it comes to um, infringing copyright, do make note of what is mentioned at paragraph um, 46, whereby there's reference to section 26 of the Copyright Ordinance, just reminding practitioners of when this is not anything new, but that section 26 talks about making available copies. And this can be done electronically. It's not, copyright is not always gonna be something physical. It can be something electronic and it falls within that section quite, scale, uh, quite squarely. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what's the difference between reproduction of digital copies and transient copies? Do note that when it comes to this aspect, there's going to be a difference. And do note that when it comes to um, transient and, and internet copies, it's going to be something that is going to be uh, by definition of the section, something you have to define very carefully. I just received a question here. Now I'll just stop here for a second and says this, on the internet, it is always difficult to find out the true identity and whereabout of the infringers. They may even come from overseas. Is there any effective way for rights owners nowadays to locate those infringers? I will get to that in the next section of this talk. Now, the next part of IP infringement really is, I'm talking about the kind of evolution of, of IP infringing. Of course, that's going to be cyber squatting and domain name, domain name parking, excuse me. And when it comes to that, of course, domain name disputes, you can have them resolved at the Asian Domain Name Dispute Resolution Center. Of course, that's part of the HKIAC. And those considerations really are going to be revolving around issues of passing off and trademark. As you can imagine, if not, it will be an instrument of deception. Um, so that is something which is going to be discussed when there's going to be a contested way in, in dealing with domain names. The other matter is sometimes how a um, defendant will use the internet as a platform by themselves through their company to sell their own goods. Again, when the internet is used as a mechanism, as you see in the case of Hugo Boss trademark uh, against the Britain Boss International case, the highlight parts I've already provided to you, but essentially the court will look at the core of what the business of the defendants will be doing. By having the online presence, the court will typically find that the online presence amplifies and really brings to order how the defendant is trying to do business, not just retail, physical on the streets, but online and how that really is looked at in terms of an act of infringement. Now, when it comes to the essence of how you're going to deal with modern day difficulties, as the question that was asked, there are gonna be three kinds of more modern forms of, of IP infringement that you have to be aware of. One is defamation and malicious falsehood by way of message boards. This is always going to be a problem, especially that's growing in Hong Kong. Message boards have always been popular. And I think because of the pandemic, they've become even more popular with people having time on their hands. But basically it's this, with a message board, it is not like a newspaper. 
A newspaper is a one-to-many type publication. A message board is a many-to-many -many publication, and they can run the defense of innocence. They didn't know what was going on. So when you look at the, um, the CFA case or real, Oriental Press against the Feverworks case, there's different considerations. It's not straight up um, publication of defamation in the sense of like a newspaper. Because of the many-to-many -many situation of a message board, you must impose or have knowledge um, affected on the message board. If you do not affect knowledge on the message board, you will not be able to establish liability. And how does one do that? You have to contact them and they have a chance to see whether the, 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 the message in question or the post in question are defamatory, then they might take it down. It is not automatic that your cause of action will be successful. So do be aware of that. Also be aware of the fact that when it comes to effecting knowledge, the way in which you do so in that pre-action letter or the cease and desist letter, you must have annexed to it all the relevant parts. Otherwise, knowledge will not be considered effective on them. Same thing I say about secondary corporate infringement. Now, when you have, um, again, defamation and malicious falsehood type cases, another typical defendant is going to be the search engine. Google, Yahoo, what have you. Do note that they will also have a typical defense of innocence. Again, without establishing that there's a substantial tort in Hong Kong in the jurisdiction, and without them knowing, then you're not going to be able to establish liability against them. This is a case that I know is going to be pursued further. So we'll look forward to any future decisions in relation to the position of the search engine. Now, on a commercial basis, the one that's going to be most uh, most um, uh, looked at by uh, commercial entities will be the sale of infringing goods by way of online platforms. To my knowledge, there hasn't been one in Hong Kong yet, but we do have them overseas. And two cases I'll just mention is this Cody Germany case, uh, Germany company against Amazon. Basically, to make a long story short, I provide you the notes and you see it for yourself. But basically, if the online platform says that all they're doing is stocking the goods, warehousing the goods, then they cannot be said to be using the trademark. Usually these are trademark type disputes. And as a result, unless they have done something more than just stalking and, and sorry, not stalking, they are um, almost acting like a warehouse in that sense. And in some cases, even perhaps less than that, they're not even having the stocking of the goods per se because they would just have that matter brought in. It's a digital footprint, but they don't actually have it in stock. So as a result, they're not using the uh, trademark per se. There's no infringement. However, prior to the Cody Germany Amazon case, there was the... L'Oreal case. The L'Oreal case against eBay was successful because in that instance, eBay went ahead and tried to promote the products. They did things which would take them closer as to being almost like a business partner and involved more in the use of the trademark in question. And as a result, eBay was found liable. There's a pending case by Christian Laboutin, which is against Amazon. I think it has some hallmarks similar to the uh, L'Oreal eBay case but that is still pending and we're waiting for that decision. Now, going to how to deal with um, enforcing your IP rights. Now, again, for those of you who are IP practitioners, none of this is going to be very new to you. But of course, once you have the infringing IP, you preserve it, check out where it came from. In other words, the details of its provenance. You're going to prepare your case accordingly. You have to get everything in order. If it's corporate, you're going to need all the corporate works. If it's registration, put all the registration uh, together, whether it's trademark, RD, short-term standard patent, what have you. Factual investigations, remember, go both internal and external because if you have a breach of confidence case. It might have been leaking out internally. Check all your computers. That's going to be something that's very important. Now, when we're talking about computers, 
in this day and age, even if it's not an internet-based question, you are going to need a computer forensic expert, for sure. Because to detail how everything happens in this day and age, we do everything through the internet and through the computers in any event. When you're doing a trap order buy, I would always strongly suggest you need at least two of everything. Two, not just because more is better, and there might be destruction of, of one of the uh, examples, because you would have to then check to see if it is actually an infringing item, such as in this case of leaders, it was a case in relation to beauty products, and therefore yet to check to see if the chemical composition was the same. In fact, it was different. So that's why one of the exhibits would have to be destroyed to figure out the chemical composition to show that it was, of course, an infringing item. Do note that when it comes to um, doing the buy, always tell your typical IP private uh, investigator to go to the showroom. Best is to go twice, buy twice. Again, you have the, 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 the infringing products available to you on two different occasions at least. This will help establish not just matters in relation to the seriousness of, an, of it, the seriousness of the, the infringing act, the right, therefore, to uh, an injunction, but also eventually you're going to have to deal with damages. Then, of course, do note that when you're going to be moving for an injunction, possibly initiating the, the proceedings as a whole, do note, please do comply with PD 22.1. It is the IP list PD. Now, going to questions of what happens when we deal with online type situations. So as mentioned in the question, how do you find out the real identity? First thing I would always do, what I typically do, is use these two websites. Once you find out where that infringing website is, of course, investigate as best you can, you use the who is search function. After that, it'll pop up the name of who is the administrator of the site. You also use the Wayback Machine to find out when and how this particular website has evolved if it's a one to many type situation. Who is search is definitely gonna be something you're gonna need in relation to message boards because that is very complicated. Because what happens with the message board is that they will always try to hide who the administrator is. And in fact, if you see through um, my point 11 at page 35, what these message boards typically do is they have a rotating roster. So you might have Mr. X on week one, but Miss Y on week two. So to find out who that rotating roster is, is going to be difficult. Now, if you're coming from overseas, that's going to be a problem because you might not have locus at all. That ISP might not be located in Hong Kong. Activity might not be, quote unquote, in Hong Kong. And of course, you can see the Starbucks case and what have you. But then you also have to consider when you're talking about these, these infringers, it's going to be, there's going to be difficult, difficulty in identifying and naming these infringers. There is no easy way to do it. Um, one example is I provided in notes uh, a, a screenshot of Lin Tang, which is a typical, very popular website in Hong Kong. Even then, it's very difficult to find out who that is. So it is my belief that if you're trying to get them as defendants, presumably one way you can do it is to do it the way in the case of the Secretary for Justice against this persons unlawfully, willfully conducting themselves, and so forth. That was the second um, earliest doxing case done in Hong Kong. And what was done in that case was that they identified them as a group in the writ by way of annexing the list. I'm presuming, because that's a doxing case, there is a parallel to that in relation to the message board situation. And as a result, so long as you're able to identify the administrator as a general person, then presumably you can proceed on that basis. Of course, you would have them, um, you would move in the injunction. The question is, would it stop the infringing act? They might not listen to you. But once you do have that writ accepted, 
and you move forward and you do get an injunctive order against them, then of course they'll be subject potentially to committal if they're in breach of the injunction. So hopefully that is a way in which you can try to sniff out and deal with identifying the infringers. And that's um, what I've provided to you. I hope these notes are useful. It's designed to be a kind of start to finish approach in dealing with, um, dealing with uh, IP infringement and also IP infringement in relation to um, internet-based uh, uh, platforms. So I can now pass it back to Hao Chen. Oh, thank you, Norman. Uh, that was fabulous. And uh, thank you for sharing your formidable experience in IP enforcement. And uh, I'm pretty sure that the audience has already learned a great deal from you. So I, I have a, uh, do we still have uh, time? Uh, can I ask you a question? Or two? Sure. I see some online as well. Yeah. Um, there's one I would perhaps want to do. Yeah, why don't you respond to the... One is in relation to Facebook. They right. use an entity in Ireland. At EOC, where I'm a board member, we found it extremely difficult to get to them. I assume you also see a lot of opacity for IP cases. How do you unravel things? All right, well, you've also mentioned here the Anton Pilar Mareva, they have no presence, that's correct. So what you would have to do is obviously to figure out where the ISP is first. Once you have the ISP, and of course, foot, uh, Facebook does have one in Hong Kong, you would have to contact them. Now, the question is, will they come back to you? You will have to treat them very much like the way in which you would treat a message board which is a many-to-many -many publication or many-to-many -many type online presence. And once you affect knowledge on them, then they would be subject to potential liability through um, their knowledge being um, given to you. Now, technically, they might try to ignore you as it were, but it would be a very dangerous game for them to do so. Because once you have that uh, potential injunction in hand, then of course, they'd be subject to contempt. The question is, will you be able to drag them into court? The answer is, I would have thought you would do something, like I mentioned before, that is that general um, case of SJ against the, 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 the persons, the doxing case. You'd use that approach to identify them as parties, and then you would go to court. There's another question is, would online infringement and other jurisdiction enables procuring infringement or passing off of IPRs in Hong Kong? Um, the, the question I think really um, is really, is there going to be an actual presence in Hong Kong? Because as we know, all IP um, causes of action are jurisdictionally based. So without them having the ISP in Hong Kong, there would be difficulty. But don't worry, because typically if they're going to be doing some form of passing off, the reason why they're doing it is, the, is because they want to do business in Hong Kong. And you can usually catch them out that way, they will eventually sit, slip something in and they'll be caught. Finally, the last question is, who is search frequently does not disclose the registrant? That's true, it doesn't always disclose it. If ISPs are exempted from liability, how to go to the factual infringers? Now that is something which I think is slightly beyond just the topic of this discussion, but I can tell you in a nutshell be basically two things. One would be you would have to do a typical kind of buy. The buy is, of course, by doing it by way of a trap order. So in this situation, you definitely will need to have, I shouldn't say definitely, but it's best to have a private investigator who specializes in IP work. That's one thing. The other thing is you can reverse engineer it. What you can then try to do is if they're not in Hong Kong, if you're not sure, again, if they're trying to do some form of business, there has to be a transaction made. Once that transaction is made in Hong Kong, you've got them. If you see through my notes, I believe at page, um, pages 32 to 35, I give you some suggestions of how that can be done. But basically, once you get that payment, you then reverse engineer it. You then go to the delivery persons as to find out where that source came from. And you have to go up the chain. It's a tedious task but it's something that you would have to do because without having 
the proper parties identified in the uh, infringing act of selling or whatever it may be, you're not going to be able to get them. But as I said, they want to make money. So eventually you can probably get them as well. Okay, how Chen? Hey, um, so I, well, I actually have two questions, but I think yeah. you, uh, the second question is about the knowledge requirement for ISPs. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think you have already talked about it quite a lot. So hmm. my first question actually uh, deals with the, the list of uh, IP specialist uh, judges here in Hong Kong. Mm. Uh, so th I think this is a recent major development yes. here, here in Hong Kong. And so I wonder whether uh, you could share uh, a little bit more information about this development. Mm. Uh, for example, uh, uh, nowadays uh, all IP cases uh, uh, you know, dealt uh, with by specialist uh, you know, judges or non-specialist judges still deal with IP cases and um, how the um, how the IP specialist the judges have uh, so, you know altered the landscape of litigating uh, you know IP cases here in Hong Kong. You know, and I'm going to uh, that's that. Yes, I'm going to share screen again and take you to PD twenty two point one, and you can see that in PD twenty two point one that there is going to be an IP judge, and there's going to be an IP list. You see at B3, all the different kinds of proceedings that will fall into the general IP list um, uh, categories. And therefore you see at PD uh, 22.1 at paragraph four, there shall be a judge, it's a single judge. And that is, as I mentioned, the Honorable Mr. Justice David Law. Yes. The, the other judges, um, I'm not sure if there is a printed list, but I can tell you, um, in the cases that I've done, in the cases that you can just see online and, and read from the judiciary website, um, uh, prior to uh, the Honorable Mr. Justice Locke, there are lots of judges who did IP cases. Um, many now have moved on to the Court of Appeal. Um, still in the Court of First Instance, I believe, um, I believe there is at least two judges will be hearing IP cases. There, sometimes you do have um, recorders and deputy high court, court judges uh, hearing IP cases. An example is uh, a order 14 case I did before deputy high court judge uh, Moral ASC, and they will sometimes be designated. So as to your question of exactly how many there are, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm guessing there would no, be no less than say three or four. Um, has that given us greater confidence in the um, IP litigation service? Certainly, because not only do we have a designated judge, that being uh, the Honorable Mr. Justice David Locke, but he's a very capable one. He's very fair-handed in his decisions. I think people now are more at ease doing IP cases in Hong Kong. Well, that's great. I've read the decisions written by uh, Justice David Locke. He is great. Yes, yep, he is. Um, do we have time? Do we still have a little bit more time for one more question, or shall we uh, finish our lecture now? Norman, how do you think? I think um, um, hopefully the uh, note which I've given you is actually, as I said, it's a paint by numbers thing. You go from start to finish, um, hopefully, with this note to give you an idea of how to typically run a, a, an IP case and one that deals with the internet. Um, I think the greatest challenge in internet-based IP cases is if you're faced with those kinds of anonymous type infringers. Anonymous infringer, uh, infringers eventually will rear their ugly head because they're trying to make money. If you're dealing with an with a infringing commercial entity, as I said earlier on, you can usually catch them out. What makes it more difficult is not your classic IP infringing commercial case, but when you're talking about message boards, that's gonna be difficult. When you're talking about defamation through message boards, because again, message boards like Li Dang, they have a rotating administrative panel. So you don't know exactly who's going to be liable at any which time, which I think the best way to do it, the way in which I, I see it, 
is to use that SJ case, that doxing case, and use that style of, of putting the defendants in a group and then moving forward. Okay, great, Norman. Uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture and thank you for sharing your precious notes with the audience. And uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, you know, uh, uh, the audience has learned a great deal. And uh, so uh, I, I wanna extend uh, you know, uh, a, a thank you note to the audience as well. And uh, uh, please do uh, join another event that our Law Tech Center will be host pretty soon. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.